Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the afternoon session. I am pleased that Kenneth Worrell is going to be with us this afternoon. He graduated from the United States Air Force Academy and served as an Air Force pilot before earning degrees as a military historian from Duke University. He taught military and recent US history at Radford University for some 26 years. He has also held teaching and research assignments with the United States Army and the United States Air Force Colleges. He has written seven books, many articles, and delivered numerous lectures and presentations on aviation history. Ken's topic today is distant, difficult, but doable. Could the Allies have bombed Auschwitz? Ken. It is indeed my pleasure to be with you today, and I want to add my comments and co congratulations to the Begin Center and to the uh, very able people who put this conference together, which is certainly very appropriate <clears throat> as we celebrate, memorialize the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, and also some of the topics that uh, this conference is touching on. Um, I look at uh, the Ukraine, and I see some parallels. Um, I look at some humanitarian crises, and I wonder uh, of the connection between um, the World War II experience and this as well. And looking back from today, um, <clears throat> one thing that's pointed out is how the technology has changed. Because if we were going to um, plan a, a bombing mission against a target today, we would have the aid of uh, satellite of weather forecasting, satellite communications. Uh, we would have in-air refueling, which would make distance irrelevant. And most importantly, we would have precision guided munitions, which would allow explosives to impact within just a few feet of the target. And what I want to impress upon you, and I hope it's one of the takeaways from, from my talk, is things were a lot different 70 years ago and much more difficult than what we may think. And of course, this is the problem the historian has of you know, dealing in the present with the past uh, and trying to get into the shoes of those people who are making those important decisions. On, on the subject of World War II, I think most of the major topics have been not only very well discussed, but pretty well settled. Uh, perhaps there's some uh, controversy about the personalities involved, the individuals, uh, but for the most part, things are, are, are pretty well settled. Uh, with one major exception, and I think that major exception really is the topic of this, of this conference. And I'm a military historian, and I, I claim no um, expertise in the Holocaust, but as I read the secondary literature on it, I was surprised to find out how much controversy there is and the great passion that is involved, um, and not just by individuals and obviously the survivors, uh, but by historians trying to deal with it. And, and that is something we have to, have to deal with. I want to make clear that what I want to deal with today is the could part of the issue of the bombing of Auschwitz, not the should part. That is, I'm going to deal with the, uh, the technology and the capabilities much more than the morality and the culpabilities. And I'll leave that for, for others to, to get into. Now, I will stray now and then off into it because it is such a fascinating and I think an important subject. The first point I would try to make is what I have not seen in the secondary literature of, of what would be the objective of a bombing assault 
I'm one of these targets. And actually, there's, uh, this is multifaceted. Um, first of all, which I had not seen discussed, would the objective have been to completely knock out the killing facilities, or would it be a gesture, a message to the Germans, uh, a message to the inmates, and a message to the world and perhaps our generation as we look back on it? Uh, that, I think that's one question about the objective. A second objective that needs to be answered, and this is more or less dealt with, uh, are, there are two specific targets that have been uh, identified. And we can deal with one of them very quickly, and that's the railroads. And a number of individuals have talked about bombing the railroads uh, to impede um, Jews and others being transported to the camps. The problem is that um, the railroads, although a very lucrative target, are a very difficult target, particularly in Europe because of the dense uh, railroad lines. And the Germans, uh, despite heavy Allied bombing, the Germans were able to make workarounds. And therefore, I think most historians, certainly military historians, have come to the consensus that trying to bomb out the railroads would have been very difficult and not counterproductive, but not productive. So my emphasis will be on uh, bombing the killing machinery at Auschwitz. Now, as a number of my uh, fellow speakers have already mentioned, the U.S. aim in the war was quite clearly to win the war as quickly as possible with the fewest allied casualties. And there is a question about how was this handled um, on the U.S. side. And I'm going to concentrate on the U.S. side because I think if any bombing had been done of Auschwitz, it would have been done by the American Air Forces. And we can get into that in a bit. There is a thin paper trail which exists in the War Department. And that paper trail is very consistent in answering requests for attacks, for bombing raids. And that came down to two related answers. And that is, the best way to aid the inmates, the best way is a speedy end of the war. And secondly, as a subset of that, is that any effort that is not directed against a military target would be a diversion. So at the War Department level, and I'm talking about the Pentagon level, this was the objective. Now, in my research, which has been primarily, primary research is primarily in the Air Force documents, there is absolutely no mention of any planning uh, to hit the Auschwitz facilities. I did find it mentioned in a couple of places, but in an interesting way, that is a target to be avoided, just as prisoner of, of war camps were to be avoided. Uh, the same thing was, was said of the numerous concentration camps that were identified. So there were no plans whatsoever, no activity at the Air Force level to make plans for a bombing of Auschwitz. Now, there are two major issues that need to be addressed when we talk about uh, the bombing of Auschwitz. That, it, that the issues of range and the issue of accuracy. The Allied Air Forces were based around the periphery of Europe uh, during World War II. Uh, the major Anglo-American bases were in Britain. After December of 1943, 
the Allies, the Anglo-American Allies, built bases in Foggia, Italy, both of which had bombers. The problem is that the British bases are 800 miles from Auschwitz, which are at the outer limit of the range of heavy four-engine bombers, uh, one of which is depicted in the, in the lobby. 800 miles is too long a distance for the shorter range twin-engine bombers and fighter bombers. Foggia was 620 miles from Auschwitz, well within the range of the long-range bombers, but just about on the margin of the range of other aircraft. The third facility, which has received next to no mention in the literature that I've read on the Holocaust and on this subject, which I find quite fascinating, and that is bases in Soviet territory. Um, one operation that the um, Americans had during World War II was an operation which was appropriately uh, codenamed Operation Frantic. And it was uh, a plan by which bases were established in Soviet territory to allow shuttle bombing from Britain, from Italy, to attack targets in Axis Europe, and then fly on to these Russian bases, rearm, refuel, and then be able to fly back. Uh, the first of these raids was launched in June of 1944. But the problem, which should not come as a surprise to anyone, even if you don't know your World War II history, that the, uh, the Russians were a very difficult ally, and that's, that's putting it mildly. They controlled precisely which targets were to be attacked, and I mean precisely. And there were numerous difficulties, and again, I understate the situation, difficulties between the American airmen and the Soviets. But there was this base facility in in Russian-controlled territory. But there was another um, way that Russian bases could be used as the Russians moved westward, and that is the bases that Rus the Russian Air Force used. Um, by the summer of 1944, the front lines of the Russian front were within 220 miles of Auschwitz which would mean, which would indicate that Russian aircraft, and I'm talking about short range fighters and fighter bombers, were well within the range of Auschwitz. The Russians had adequate numbers of aircraft, uh, they were within range, and they were well trained and uh, very well skilled in getting bombs within a short distance of a target. To my knowledge, and I've not seen this in the primary or in any of the secondary sources. Uh, I've seen no requests that were made to the Soviets uh, to use either their bases or to use their aircraft to bomb targets in Au Auschwitz. I trust that's not a fire alarm. <laughs> I hope my uh, talk hasn't been that incendiary thus far. Um, another effort that uh, has been discussed by some authors to, to deal with this effort, uh, this difficulty of range, was to use uh, an allied airstrip on the island of Vis, uh, which is in the Adriatic off the coast of the former Yugoslavia. If that ba base could be used, that would shorten the distance between Foggia and Auschwitz by 100 miles on each end. Unfortunately, the authors don't go into the fact that this was a short runway, and it really wasn't a runway, it was a dirt strip with very minimal uh, resources and would have required considerable effort uh, to upgrade for a major operation. Um, so we have this problem of range. I go on to state, however, that uh, there were a number of attacks on a target that was only three or four miles from Auschwitz, uh, an oil facility, uh, 
there were four attacks on that target. And in the lobby, there are, are some photographs uh, that were taken. Um, at least three of those four targets uh, of the mission reports that I saw, literally the bombers flew right over the camp, uh, which also helps explain those, some of those photographs. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have the captions out there to, to explain those photographs. Uh, some of them were uh, taken from the bombers themselves. Uh, they were wired that when the bombs dropped, camera, the pit, you know, the, the film would start. Uh, so they're they're not filming what has been bombed, but what is what is to be bombed, and that's why you see pictures of the bombs falling. And on reconnaissance missions, uh, which are I know are a number of those photos, um, the reconnaissance pilot would start the cameras before he got to the target. And, and what occurred was um, the Air Force wasn't interested in anything but the oil factory itself. But some 30 years ago, some uh, enterprising individuals at the CIA uh, knew of this film that had been kept. And we obviously we kept those, those photographs for other purposes. Uh, they developed these pictures and then they used the, uh, the technology they had at the time, in, as I say, 20 years ago, which was much more sophisticated than uh, what the airmen had during World War II, to give us those splendid photographs. My point is that that information, all of that information, was not available in 1944. In addition to those four specific missions that went over the target, uh, there were 2,800 other bombers that flew uh, within a 45-mile radius of Auschwitz to attack oil targets. So range was not a difficulty for um, the long-range bombers. But accuracy was a considerable difficulty. And despite the claims of the uh, American airmen and the talk of pickle-barrel bombing and the press releases during the war and Air Force history since the war, accuracy was a major difficulty. Now, I guess I need to get off on a side issue which plays a big part in the story, and that is the concern that the airmen had for civilian casualties or collateral casualties, whatever term you would prefer to use. Um, the American airmen tried to not bomb civilians but the problem is that the bombs kind of went their own way on many, many occasions. This was of a particular concern when the American airmen were bombing targets in occupied territories. And I'm talking about Poland, France, Belgium, Norway. You can go down the list of the occupied countries. This was uh, comes to the fore with the um, preparations for the D-Day invasion when General Eisenhower and the Army wanted communications targets, railroads, to be taken out, which would mean bombing of Belgian and French rail yards. The problem was for every bomb that you dropped on a rail yard, a number went into the towns and to civilians. The airmen made a survey of this and estimated that there would be uh, somewhere around 160,000 French casualties, one quarter of which would be fatal. Uh, the airmen were against this, but Eisenhower insisted, and he did get the permission of both Churchill and Roosevelt, you know, went up to that level, uh, to conduct this bombing. Uh, fortunately, the bombing wasn't that bad but the belief is that about 25,000 civilians were, were killed by this bombing. So this was of con considerable concern to the Americans. Um, and this brings us up to the camp itself. The killing facilities at Auschwitz were about 1,000 feet from the edge of the camp. The accuracy of 
long-range, high-altitude American bombers was believed at the time to be 1,000 feet, that same distance. From my research, I believe that 1,000 feet was optimistic. There was an effort by the commanders to make their, their bombing look better than it, what it was. Um, there was a difficulty in assessing the bombing, not being able to find where the bombs had landed. So I think 1,000 feet is when best came to best. Um, there were, and, and when I say 1,000 feet, that is in a day of, like today, of good visibility, uh, minimal winds, uh, minimum obstructions of, of the target. And of course, that wasn't always the case. So we can estimate then if, in fact, they reached that 1,000 foot accuracy, which again, I doubt, that a good number of bombs would have fallen into the camp. And the estimates that some of my predecessors have made, that this would amount to perhaps 20 to 25 percent of the bombs that were dropped. Now, some historians have estimated that it would take 200 to 700 tons of bombs to take out the killing facilities. So you can work out the math of one quarter of that 200 to 700 tons of bombs would have fallen into the camp. Um, and you probably can make a rough guess of how many inmates would have been killed um, by these bombs. And although that's um, difficult, I think it's even more difficult to estimate how many lives would have been saved if those killing facilities had been knocked out. Now, a number of individuals have talked about um, ways to decrease or improve that bombing accuracy. One way would be with uh, the use of low-level tactics. Um, the lower you get, less deflection on the bombs, you can bring the bombs in, in closer. Of course, the problem with flying low is you have obstacles of the ground, you have smokestacks, you have trees, you have high tension wires, you have birds, um, there's all kinds of difficulties. And of course, if the enemy is alerted, you are much more uh, prone to enemy fire. What I would emphasize to you, and this is the practical experience, is that the American experience with low-level bombing had been disastrous. Um, probably many of you know of the famous Doolittle uh, Tokyo raids of April 1942, when we launched 16 twin-engine bombers off an aircraft carrier to attack Japan. Uh, but because Murphy's Law was at work, um, they ran into a, a Japanese picket ship, which forced them to launch before they wanted to. They had insufficient range. So all 16 of those 16 bombers were lost, 16 out of 16. In Europe, they had a similar uh, instance. Uh, when they launched, uh, again, twin-engine bombers against some uh, targets in Holland. And on the second of these missions, 12 bombers went out. One had to abort because of mechanical problems, which alerted the Germans. The remaining 11 bombers were shot down. They lost 11 out of those 11 bombers. But probably the most famous mission, and the one that I think gives us some lessons when we try to talk about uh, bombing Auschwitz, was the 1 August 1943 mission against Ploesti, Ploesti refineries. Now, clearly, Ploesti is not altogether parallel with Auschwitz. Ploesti was a high priority target. It was the uh, source of about 40% of German oil. It was at the top of the target list. Um, Churchill, Roosevelt, George Marshall, the chiefs of staff, Everybody wanted to take out Ploesti. Uh, but nevertheless, there are some parallels. It was a very long distance target, um, and it was a difficult target. The point I would want to make and to leave with you, again, that Murphy's Law was at work and how the best laid plans could go astray. Because this mission against Ploesti was the best planned and the best prepared mission that the Americans flew in the European theater. Uh, they went to the length of coming up with new kinds of maps, 
Uh, they went to the lengths of laying out dummy targets in the desert and flying practice missions against these targets at low level. Uh, they modified the aircraft with additional guns and armor and fuel tanks. And yet, it came a cropper. It came a cropper because they didn't plan on the weather. Uh, the weather in, in Europe is very fickle, and before the days of satellites, uh, very difficult, particularly over the mountains between Italy and uh, Romania, uh, the weather over the target, and human error. Um, the commander of the mission literally made a wrong turn. And as a result, and I'm not making this up because this is the stuff out of um, TV drama, in the middle of the mission, American bombers were flying on collision courses at 100 feet above the ground uh, in between smokestacks, burning fuel tanks, and German anti-aircraft. And as a result, one-third of those bombers, one-third, were lost. Um, and if that's not the end of the story with low-level flying, Ploesti was such an important target that the bombing went on, and there was an effort by the Americans to fly um, fighter bombers against the target, twin-engine aircraft, and they went in at low level, and they suffered one-third losses. My point is how the best plans could go astray and the bad experience that Americans had with low-level flying. Now, quite correctly, uh, some bring up well, the best airplane to use is not these high-level bombers, uh, but the British twin-engine Mosquito bomber. And I don't want to get into technical details, which gets us off the track of what we're dealing with here. Uh, but this was a very versatile aircraft, uh, a very different aircraft, um, but one which was very successful. Um, but you need to know from the outset that the Mosquito bomber, or the Mosquito aircraft, was a very a versatile aircraft and was fielded in a number of varieties. Rec reconnaissance version, night fighter version, uh, fighter version, and a bomber version. And the problem is there were no bomber versions based in Foggia that were within range of Auschwitz. Um, but again, authors point out the fact that uh, the Mosquito had been used successfully in low level raids and as mentioned earlier, uh, the most famous of which was against the um, jail at Omens, uh, France. Uh, when the Allies found out that some resistance leaders were going to be executed, uh, they came up with this mission uh, to try to help them escape. Uh, they went in at, at low level, and they were able to take out the walls and allow something like 280 prisoners uh, to get out. And this mission is kind of pointed at, you know, if it could be done at Omens, then why not at Auschwitz? But what you need to know and what is left out is that, yes, there were successes, but there were also failures, one of which, again, by Mosquito bombers, again, which was against a Gestapo target, uh, this time in Copenhagen at low level, and a bomb went astray, hit a school, killing 86 children and 26 adults, uh, and three of the 18 bombers were knocked down. So there were good days and there were bad days. There is um, one other mission I want to mention, which again is held up like the Amens um, jail bombing uh, as a parallel to Auschwitz. And that is uh, some missions that were flown uh, to resupply the guerrilla resistance at Warsaw. And what the critics say, the critics of the Allies' failure not to bomb, is, well, if it could be done at Warsaw, which had similarities to Auschwitz, it was a distant target, uh, it was not a direct military target, um, why, why, if the Allies did this, did they not attack Auschwitz? And again, I don't want to get into this part of that topic because it's already been touched upon, but in my quick, uninformed judgment, it had to do with the fact that the, uh, uh, the Polish uh, 
overseas government had sway. Uh, and secondly, there were something like 140,000 Poles uh, fighting on the Allied forces. And there were a number of Polish units, including Air Force or RAF units with the Poles. Uh, the story for those few of you who don't know this, I assume that most of you do, is that on the 1st of August, 1944, the Polish underground rose up, um, counting on the advance of the Soviet armies, which were coming very rapidly to the west. And of course, what they were counting on is that in short order, uh, the Soviets would overrun Poland and uh, the Germans would be pushed out. But surprisingly, uh, the Soviet army stops five miles from, from Warsaw and does not advance into the city until January. And again, we won't get off into you know, why did the Soviets stop five miles from, from Warsaw. There are immediate calls to, to supply this, this uprising. Uh, again, there's this distance problem, a distance that's even greater uh, than the problem between Foggia or England and Auschwitz. Um, the airmen were against this, both American airmen and the British airmen, because of, of the dangers that were involved with range and the German defenses. Uh, nevertheless, there was pressure from the highest level, Churchill, Roosevelt, and down the line of the, the military. Uh, the problem was the range issue. We put, we, the Western allies, put pressure on the, on the Russians to allow their bases to be used for this, and they refused. Even though we had these bases, which I already mentioned to you, these frantic bases, that were already equipped uh, to be able to use these things. Eventually, uh, the Soviets did permit one mission to be flown by the Allies. And that was um, a supply mission by an American unit. Uh, but by then, and this is in uh, mid-September, uh, they were only able to get, of the 1,800 canisters. They dropped canisters with supplies, munitions, food, and the rest. They dropped 1,800 of them. Only a little over 1,000 were, uh, were recovered. The British and the Poles flew missions uh, to supply uh, Warsaw. And that was round trip missions from Foggia up to Warsaw and back which was a tremendous distance, and they suffered very heavy, heavy casualties. Um, 35 Polish crews were lost, and 19 RAF and South African crews were lost. So this was a very expensive operation. We attempted to fly, we, the United States, we attempted to fly one more mission to supply the uh, the Poles in Warsaw, and the Russians refused. So that's the story of, of the missions. I think there's some other elements that are neglected when we talk about the possibilities of, of bombing Auschwitz, one of which I think is uh, overlooked is that of timing. Um, and there's a number of elements to this. The first element is. The earlier the timing, if you were, these bombings were to take place, uh, if anyone were, were to be saved, more would be saved if you bombed earlier. But the problem of bombing earlier is that the German defenses were much more stout earlier in the war than they were later on. And it is not until probably around April of May of 44, probably by the summer of 44, that German defenses are, are weakened. So that's one reason why the, the timing is, is shifted towards the summer of 1944. Another reason, which I alluded to, is the weather. Because to have accurate bombing, you needed clear weather. And I mean literally clear weather. Um, and the, the records of the, the bombers flying out of Italy indicate that probably the only time you really had consistent uh, clear weather is in the summer, uh, and in this case, the summer of 1944. The other part of the context 
and the timing comes from the fact what else was going on in the war at the same time. And what I'm talking about here is um, from the beginning of 1944 up through the summer of 1944, there was a tremendous effort that was involved in bombing German V-1 flying bomb facilities. And there was a big effort uh, to stop this. Then comes the preparations for the Normandy invasion, which begins in May, which focuses the Allied Anglo-American airmen. And after the invasion is launched, some considerable effort is, is used uh, to make sure that that invasion sticks, that those invaders are not thrown into the sea. And then, of course, to support them in the breakout uh, from the beachhead. And finally, if that's not enough on your platter uh, for the airmen, what most non-aviation historians uh, are unaware of was the introduction of the German jets, uh, which first see combat in June of 1944, which in the end, when we look back on it, turned out to be more of a threat than a reality. But nevertheless, the airmen at the time were really um, quite concerned uh, because the German jets were about 100 miles an hour faster than the best Allied aircraft and had the capability uh, to upset uh, the balance of power and air superiority. Uh, so there was uh, a lot going on uh, during this time. Uh, the final comment I want to make that, again, I don't see in any of the literature, and, and again, I, I don't claim to have seen it all, uh, is what would have been the German reaction if Auschwitz had been attacked. And what I mean by this, clearly the Germans had other means of killing Jews besides the gas chambers at Auschwitz, as they had shown before. Uh, would they have used these methods? Uh, would they have rebuilt the killing machinery at Auschwitz? Uh, or would they have used the inmates as human shields around the rebuilding of these facilities or around other targets? Or to go even further, would they have used allied Anglo-American prisoners of war as human shields? And what you need to know here is that Anglo-American prisoners were very well treated by the Germans. They followed the Geneva Convention. And you know, you ask why, besides anecdotal, uh, the fact is that fewer than 2% of American prisoners of war died in German prisons. About 50% of Soviet prisoners died in German prisons. And in the Pacific Theater, about 50% of American prisoners died in Japanese prison camps. And finally, would the Germans have used poison gas? Which I think is one of those lingering questions that really has not been addressed because the Germans had an advantage uh, with chemical weapons and yet did not use them. So I would raise the question, you know, what would have been the German uh, reaction? They would have done something, but what would that have been? OK, to sum up then, from a military point of view for the bombing of Auschwitz, uh, the best bet would have been for the Soviets to have used their short-range bombers uh, from targets. And again, I have no knowledge whatsoever. I have not read, seen, or heard anything about any requests made to, to the Soviets. The second best solution would have been, been to have used mosquito um, bombers. But mos the mosquito bombers were not in Foggia and would have required considerable resources to have moved them from Britain down to Italy along with their support facilities. The third best, and I think if the order had been given, um, the way things would have gone, would have been the use of high-level American long-range bombers. And I've already discussed with you um, the problems there and the so-called 1,000-foot um, accuracy. So therefore, to answer my question, which I have posed, um, distant, difficult, but doable, 
I think quite clearly um, the bombing of Auschwitz by the Allies clearly was doable. But I would rearrange my title then to read um, Bombing Auschwitz, uh, Distant, Difficult, Doable, But Was It Practical? Best I can tell, there were no anti-aircraft guns at Auschwitz, but it was three miles away from this oil facility, which did have anti-aircraft guns. And of course, the problem is those airplanes and those formations, you can't turn on a dime, so they would have come within range of these other, other targets. So directly to your question, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, there were none, uh, but there were some that any attack on Auschwitz would have encountered. However, I would quickly add, certainly not to the density of, of Ploesti, which I talked about, or other highly defended targets. Well, the, the problem is that they, you know, they didn't do any reconnaissance of, of uh, Auschwitz in that sense, so that the Allies had that kind of information. But no, they're, they're, to my knowledge, no. To, to answer your question directly, uh, there, there, are, there are, to my knowledge, there, are, there were no plans. But again, I would refer back to the context. By March, the effort was directed towards this Normandy invasion, and that really focused the Allies at, at that point. To, to, to my knowledge, the only bombing they were talking about, taking out railroad targets as an economic target, to you know, stop supplies and all, but no, certainly nothing specific to what you're, I believe you're referring to. That's that's not entirely that's not entirely correct. Yes, it does. 
That this is you're asking me a question I can't answer. I, I, I'm making a, I'm I'm talking about a military. My my focus is on the military aspects, and I thought I covered the fact that the as you have stated correctly, that the War Department came back with this idea that the diversion was one major reason, and the other was the best way to aid the inmates was by a speedy end of the war, and that the airmen never got an order from anybody and never generated their own plan. But there was, and I, in the interest of times, I did not talk about it. There is one mentioned by one commander uh, who mentions that we don't want to bomb and kill, kill the inmates because it'll just give the Germans an excuse to do whatever they want. I am not. Uh, I'm not making up a reason. I'm only observing. Um, I'm only observing the evidence that I saw, and I, I expect that there there may be other evidence out there, but I'm unaware of. First of all, that, that's an estimate made by five authors, and I, no, I, I do not take responsibility. I just okay. repeated um, how many bombers. Each bomber has more got the math because I can't that quickly on my feet. But I about two, about two and it. Two and it. Okay. Each each bomber could carry about two and a half tons. So divide the, whatever number you like by two and a half. What I was trying to present is that if the commanders were presented with this issue, I believe that they would have brought up the issue of we're going to kill civilians um, because of the accuracy issue. Okay. But, th that, that, but that was never brought up. No. So we're looking back. Monday, Monday morning quarterback, and we're looking back on this. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, th that, but I would also expect the, the leader who, who issued that order would have to take some moral responsibility for either refusing it or, or not. But that, again, that, that order never... I don't think I, I don't. I, I, I just I pass. I, I, pass I, I was trying to stay away from the should part of, of this. 
All I can say is they had other targets. They had other, they had other priorities. I, 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 I find myself trying to defend a policy that I had nothing to do with, and I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm not sure that I agree with. As I say, as a historian, I'm, I'm an observer of this whole thing, and the only thing I can mention, which I, I know that many of you, if not most of you, find difficult to believe, is that the Allies had had other priorities. And secondly, I brought up the issue of the uh, collateral casualties to make the point that there was a moral responsibility that the airmen the bombardier, the pilot, his commander, and right up the chain, they had a moral responsibility too and had to live with their conscience. And there was considerable concern about civilian casualties writ large, especially allied civilians. And again, keep in mind, not, not German civilians. Um, and when you talk about the map, I don't know about a, a map, but I do know that the Allied airmen were told not, they were shown where the Allied POW camps were and concentration camps were, and they were warned, admonished, you know, not to do anything close to them. I hope that's it. 
No, no I, I think America went into the world because of Pearl Harbor. There was a big isolationist element in this country before Pearl Harbor. The draft, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the draft, which came up in 1940, um, was tried to be renewed. It passed by one vote you know, right before the war, so there's considerable um, isolationist sentiment. And, but Pearl Harbor turned this around. Germany declared war on the United States. We got into it. And I would also mention that uh, one of the decisions, which has not been mentioned here in talking about Roosevelt, was the decision for unconditional surrender, that we were not going to end the war with some kind of conditions with the Germans. So there was this you know, moral element involved. But I think the Americans were guided primarily by the, by the military element and were naive in, in the politics and, and the rest that went with it. 